Good afternoon. My name is Lucy Kornbluth. I am an assistant professor of surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. My clinical practice includes trauma surgery and acute care surgery and surgical critical care. And my research is primarily focused on post-injury coagulopathies, platelet biology, and transfusion medicine. Thank you to the college for the opportunity to be here virtually, to Dr. Sperry and Cohen for inviting me to join this panel and to my co-panelists. I'm going to wrap things up on this panel with discussion on the potential benefit and current evidence of whole blood use in civilian trauma patients. My disclosures are related to the funding of my research, and I am on a scientific advisory board for a global blood products company, but I will not specifically discuss any products that I advise on in today's discussion. So today we will finish up by discussing the potential benefits and current evidence behind the use of whole blood in trauma. And we're going to focus on the following, the definitions of whole blood, that I believe are necessary to interpret the literature, a discussion of the hypothesized benefits of whole blood, what we know from the civilian data and therefore what we don't know, and finally the take homes. So understanding the whole blood trauma literature does require a discussion of the differences between various types of whole blood. First, there is the classically described warm, fresh whole blood, which can be transfused immediately. It's often referred to as the walking blood bank. It's considered to have full hemostatic potential. It is collected from pre-screened donors when possible. So that means that it is currently only available in the military setting. It does not undergo transfusion transmitted disease testing or TTD testing at the time of transfusion. And so what that means is that it's not approvable by the FDA and that there is a higher risk of disease transmission. So even in the military, it becomes reserved for situations in which tested blood products are unavailable or ineffective. It can be stored at room temperature and then used within 24 hours of its collection, or it can be refrigerated within eight hours of collection. And it's important to understand this because it is not what we are going to talk about today. What we are talking about today is what is available for civilians, which is cold stored, low titer O hold blood. Now this is fully TTD tested. It's refrigerated at one to six degrees Celsius. Its storage life varies depending on which citrate anticoagulant is being used between 21 and 35 days. Some programs will use it for shorter periods of time in order to then be able to recycle into red cells. It can be shipped around the globe because it's refrigerated. And it is now the preferred product in the military for all damage control resuscitations. But when interpreting the literature, there are some important considerations and differences that may be present between the whole blood that is included in each program. So that can include anti-A, anti-B, antibody titer levels, which can range between 50 and 200 in the literature, and it's not standardized whether it's group O or non-group O and measures of hemolysis in that setting. The RH status, whether they're using RH negative exclusively or using RH negative and RH positive, but only transfusing to men and women over 50. And then again, what the anticoagulant that was used was and therefore what the shelf life is. So this is the product that we're going to discuss going forward today. Now, why whole blood at all? What are the potential benefits? Well, there are many that are discussed and supported by various investigations that include potential benefits related to the actual products like composition, volume, hemostatic capacity. And then there are potential benefits related to the delivery, which include ease of administration and ease of implementation. And we'll talk about all of these. So first, the composition of warm whole blood is undeniably superior. 
The composition of cold whole blood is also superior, but it is subject to effects of processing and storage. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Now the whole bloods specifically are superior in volume that is required for the same repletion of oxygen carrying capacity platelets, coagulation factors, fibrinogen, and the hemostatic capacity is superior. But there are some considerations related to the hemostatic capacity specifically of the cold stored whole blood that I wanna focus in on a little bit. So it's important to recognize that the in vitro data does suggest that in cold stored whole blood beyond 14 days, the hemostatic capacity does begin to wane. And using leuco reduction, even with platelet sparing filters can reduce both the platelet count and the platelet function. But what's important to really recognize here is that it's very affected by the storage time, similar to the hemostatic capacity. So the storage time does change the product. Now the potential benefits that are related to ease of administration really include everything that comes with giving one bag of something versus giving multiple bags of something and giving something that requires no processing, no thawing. The logistics on the blood banking side of just putting one bag in a cooler not having to deal with what can go in the cooler, what has to stay out of the cooler. And then of course, all the nursing aspects that include checking one black bag instead of three bags of product. And all of this will contribute to the ease of delivery of whole blood in multiple locations, pre-hospital, urgent release in the ED, massive transfusion protocols. And all of this does have the potential to decrease time to transfusion of product in the setting of massive hemorrhage, and need for urgent release of product. So I think the possible potential benefits of whole blood are undeniably significant. But despite the clear potential benefits and theoretic superiority of the product, the civilian data I'm going to highlight is complex to interpret. We're going to primarily focus on the clinical prospective observational and randomized controlled trials that exist in the modern time period. I will mention some of the results from the retrospective data, but again, we'll primarily focus on the prospective data. So the modern era of this really started in about 2013. Dr. Cotton and colleagues published results of a pilot trial that randomized patients to either receive what was a modified cold stored whole blood or conventional component therapy on arrival for their initial resuscitation with a whole blood limitation of six units. And they did not find any differences in the amount of blood products transfused, except in a subset of brain injury patients. Now, seven years later, this group compared low titer O whole blood, which was different than the exact product composition of what was used in their first study versus components. And this time they found fewer post whole blood products received, but they did not find a clear mortality benefit. And then there were many retrospective studies. And these retrospective studies primarily showed minimal to no significant mortality differences, but they also showed no major safety concerns. And there were more overall, again, no notable mortality differences, no significant safety concerns. And then there was the Pittsburgh experience, which has developed much of the prospective observational data around this. So to focus in on the Pittsburgh experience in the last five years, especially given our panel today has many of the Pittsburgh experts on it. In prospective observational studies, they have shown the safety of transfusion of cold stored, uncross-matched, leuco-reduced, group O, low titer, less than 50 anti-A, anti-B, platelet replete, whole blood for hemorrhagic shock. 
this first study up to a maximum of two units. They then showed no evidence of hemolysis in the group O or non-group O whole blood recipients. They then showed safety and no hemolysis up to four units. But you can see that the vast majority of the prospective data is not using large volumes of low titer O whole blood that's cold stored. They're using small volumes up to a maximum of six units. Dr. Schreiber did a report with his colleagues on the case of a patient who received 38 units of low titer O whole blood without transfusion reaction. But there are only really retrospective and case reports of these very large volume transfusions of this product. So the vast majority of the prospective studies can really only support our understanding up to about six units of low titer O whole blood that's transfused to trauma patients. So what do we take away from this? Well, I think we take away that giving cold stored whole blood to civilians does have potential benefits, including related to the product and the ease of administration. The aggregate data supports that cold stored whole blood is at least as effective as component therapy in trauma resuscitation when limited to six units or less. And importantly, at that volume, it is safe and the effects of leuco reduction, although present, are small based on the data that we have, which is primarily in vitro. But outside of case reports and retrospective considerations, there's really not enough data to support its use for very high volume massive transfusions. We need more data in that area. So I'd summarize that resuscitating injured and bleeding trauma patients with cold stored whole blood does appear to be safe and offers advantages over component therapy, but we need more high quality clinical data and specifically on the safety and superiority of cold stored whole blood in large volumes for massive transfusion. Thank you again to the college, to Dr. Sperry, Cohen, and my co-panelists. And I can be reached at this email at any time.